All right, Philippians chapter 4. We'll be coming, covering two verses today, verse 6 and 7. Winning the war on anxiety. If you look at, uh, look at the different chapters, we're now in the last chapter. The first chapter of uh, the book of Philippians, Paul really stresses to have a single eye, to have Christ first in our life. And then if you look at chapter 2, he stresses humility, to be humble before the Lord and to consider each other as better than ourselves. And then in chapter 3, he talks about looking at life from a spiritual perspective. And then in chapter 4, he really begins to, to drill and, and to dig in and how we are to think and, or mind. And even the rest of the chapters we go down, Paul will continue on that theme of how we are to think as Christians. What's supposed to go on in our mind? And this morning, he's going to talk about, uh, about anxiety and how we are to handle that in our life. For several years, this woman had been having to sleep at night because she feared burglars. And one day, her husband um, heard a noise downstairs, and he went downstairs, and sure enough, there was a burglar who had broken into the house. He welcomed a burglar. He says, welcome. Come upstairs and meet my wife. She's been waiting for you for 10 years. You know, Rolf was in, in deep trouble. But it seemed that he was doing very little to help himself. And a friend advised him. He says, Rolf, you've got two hands. Why don't you do something? I am, said Rolf. I'm wringing both of them. You know, worry is contagious, isn't it? When you're worried and you're stressed out. If you're a husband, you might it affect your wife and she becomes worried. Or if you're a mom and you're worried and stressed out, then that might pass over to your kids and now your kids become anxious and, and uh, you know, difficult to work with and so forth. So it, it carries on. Worry is contagious. There was a, a guy who was about to jump off a bridge and commit suicide and just then an officer pulled up and he saw him and he he walked up to him really slow, and he started talking to him, engaged him in conversation, and he, he finally approached a man. He said, there's nothing so bad in life that you would want to take your life, is there? And the man began to share of, of all the troubles that he had and just how his wife left him and how he lost his job and how he went bankrupt and now he's losing his house. And he, for half an hour, he continued just to share all his problems. And then they joined hands, and they both jumped. And so... It can be contagious, and all of us, at times, worry about something, don't we? I think some of us might admit that we worry more than others. Some people are just worry warts. They worry about everything. And, um, and so Paul, in this chapter, he's going to tell us what to do about worry. If we look at last week, we saw that Paul <clears throat> uses military language when he addresses these things here that he is in chapter 4 he uses military language he says in verse 1 he says stand fast it's like a military a soldier stand fast even though you're surrounded with the enemy stand fast or he says be of the same mind you know stand together teamwork as you go out into battle as 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 troops as soldiers and then he says rejoice that is not an option it's a command be gentle and now he's going to give us another command. It's not a suggestion. It's a command that he gives us. And that is that we are not to be anxious. Be anxious for nothing. This is easy to say. But it's a lot harder to do. How can we do that practically? Well, Paul will give us some tools on how to win the war and worry. So let's begin reading in verse 6. It says, um, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, words carry a different level of weight, depending who says them. If you talk about, say, forgiveness, that has an impact. Or if I talk about forgiveness, it has an impact. But if Corey Ten Boom would stand here today and she would share about forgiveness, that would be powerful. Why? Because of what she's been through. Because of her being in concentration camp, she and her sister, Betsy, and how they were treated. And 
near starvation and uh, shivering in cold and in lice and, and, and this guard that was so brutal to them, and especially brutal, just picking them and just giving them a really difficult time until her sister actually lost uh, her life due to the cruelty of this guard. And she traveled all over the country sharing on just forgiveness and forgiving people until one day this guard that had, was really the cause of the death of her sister and much cruelty to her came up and he extended his hand and asked for forgiveness. Now these are her words. This is what she says. And, I sit, and she says, and I still I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. So the guy stands before her with his hands outstretched asking for forgiveness. She recognized him that she was, he was the guard. So he says, I stood there with coldness clutching my heart, but forgiveness is not an option or an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I trust my hand into the one stretched out to me. These are her words, and they carry a lot of weight. Why? Because of what she had to forgive because of the amount that she had to forgive, so to speak, because of all the cruelty and even the life of her sister to forgive her killer. That was a lot. And so when she would talk about forgiveness, that carries a lot of weight. So for Paul to come and say, don't be anxious, don't worry, does he know what he's talking about? Has Paul been tested? Well, if we look at Paul and we see what Paul has been through and we go to Corinthians where Paul went through all these trials that he mentions, we know that he's been through a lot. He's been beaten, he's been uh, robbed, he's been in hunger, he's been near starvation, he's been out in the open sea, he's been through all of that. And we know that in this particular chapter or, or, or book that Paul is writing, he's writing to the Philippians who, well, there's division going on in the church. Uh, uh, Eunice and, and, and Syntyche uh, are not getting along. Uh, rather, Eoria and Syntyche are not getting along. There's division in the church. It, no doubt he would have reason to be worried about that, about that. He is living in a rented house under house arrest. He's not sure what the trial is going to turn out to be because he's awaiting trial. He might be beheaded. Certainly that's something to think about, to be worried about. Um, and maybe his support. Who was going to support Paul? Who was paying for the rent of the house that he was renting? Or his food and just his daily supply. Maybe that would run out. Paul could have been worried about that also. And then there were Christians going around in Rome at that time who were trying to give Paul a really hard time. They were preaching the gospel in a way that they were hoping that it was going to offend Paul. Maybe some believe that Paul maybe put some people, kind of removed some people from a leading position. But when he was under house arrest, he could not tend to the churches. And so they came back and they tried to, well, show Paul that, hey, you know, we don't have to obey. We just do whatever we want. I don't know what they did, but, the, but they were trying to do it in a way that would cause pain to Paul. So Paul had a lot of things to be worried about. And yet, in spite of all of this, he says, be anxious for nothing. Now, some of us here this morning might be living with anxiety. That's just something that you go through from time to time. Some of you might be just, that's almost like a way of life. It's just, you're just anxious. And I, I think that's possible that we, that we spend a lot of our life living in verse 6. There's, it says, you know, anxious. And that's just where we are. But the idea that Paul has is that we're to graduate to verse 7. That speaks about peace. And so, anxiety versus peace. George Mc, uh, McGoslin was the director at YMCA, and he was working long hours. He'd been, he was working 75-hour uh, weeks and occasionally working weekends, and he was just, he was just going at it. And he suffered a, a minor heart attack and he had to go to the hospital and the doctor told him, if you're not going to slow down and you're going to take it a little bit more easy, 
you will you have about a year to live you don't have that much longer your the way you lived is taking a toll on your life and he went home and he wrote God a letter he went out to the back porch and he wrote God a letter he says dear God I hereby resign as general manager of the universe love George and he said that wonder of wonders God accepted his resignation and so sometimes maybe we are in a position where we need to just resign from trying to be the manager of the universe like George and so Paul would say here be anxious verse 6 for nothing now the word anxious is translated some 19 times in the New Testament so it's it's something that is relevant and it means in Latin it would mean to strangle or to be in distress when you're anxious it's like being strangled you're in distress uh, in the Greek, it'd be like being pulled in different directions to, be, to have a divided mind. Um, it's, your, your hope pulls you in one direction and, and your worries pull you in an opposite direction. You're, you have this divided mind. James 1 verse 8 speaks of being double-minded, unstable in all our ways, just being tuzzed back and forth. And that is what worry is, isn't it? It's kind of like a rocking chair that gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. And so, <clears throat> double-minded, uh, pulled in different directions, anxiety. Talks about stress, isn't that? That's stress. And uh, I was reading a poll that was recently done according to the American Psychological Association. They said that a recent poll that they did uh, people said, 44% of people said that over the last year, their stress had actually gone up. They felt they were more stressed now than they were just some time ago. And then the question might be, what do people worry about? What are they stressed about? Well, there were different things. Money, it was kind of high up on the list. Work, the economy, relationships, personal health. These were things that people tend to worry about. Now, if you think about stress, is it helpful? Well, the answer is no, because when you worry, it affects your health. It, it can cause high blood pressure, it, it heart disease, obesity, diabetes, ulcers. It can lower your immune system. It has a huge impact on our physical body. So it's obviously that God doesn't want us to be worried, right? He doesn't want us to be stressed out and cause damage to our physical body. Stress can actually cause death. I was reading up on this. According to the Center of, for Disease Control of National Institute, this is what they came up with. They said that 110 million people die every year as a direct result of stress. That is, seven people every two seconds in the world, they estimate, die as a direct result of stress. And so... We see that people worry, and it has seriously serious implications. In one poll they did, they, 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 they asked people what they worried about, and then they asked, so did this actually take place in your life? The things that you worried about. Well, in 40% of the cases, the things that they had been worrying about never came to pass. And 30% of the t things that they worried about were things that they couldn't change, so it was useless to really worry about them. 12% were things about like criticism from other people that were mostly untrue. And then 10% had to do with health, which only gets worse if you worry about them. And it was only 8% that was really considered legitimately uh, or legit, legit uh, what they worried about. And so most of the things that people tend to worry about is something that we can change, probably won't happen, or something we can't do anything about. So why worry about these things? Well, we still do. And so Paul would say, be anxious for nothing. In the Greek, it's emphatic. It says, don't worry about even one single thing. Don't worry about even one single thing. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? 
I think Jesus understood that, that people tend to worry. And he encourages us to look to the birds as an example. He feeds them. He takes care of them. Normally when you go out and you do bird watching, they're happy, right? They're, they're chirping and they're jumping around and, and they're happy. You rarely or never see a bird that has its claws, its head in its claws, and is scratching his head and he's worried about food for the next day. You just don't see that. They're, they're happy. Now, if God takes care of birds and he feeds them, aren't we of more value? That's what Jesus says. Hey, just figure it out. <laughs> uh, think about that for a minute. We are much more, we have much more value than a bird has. So if God takes care of them, how much more will he take care of us? So don't worry. Because worry is unproductive. I don't think worry is really becoming of a child of God. It shows that we don't trust in his power and his wisdom. So notice he says, be anxious for nothing. And then notice the word, but. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. What Paul is saying with that word, he says, don't do this, but do that. Don't do this, but do that. He gives us a reason. Or he gives us, uh, um, uh, he, he re- tells us to replace worry with something else. You guys know the song by Bobby McFerrin. That song used to be on the radio a lot. I don't know if it's on the radio today. I don't listen to secular radio that much today. But Bobby McFerrin had that song, Don't Worry, Be Happy. You guys know that song? I remember way back, it was one of the first times I ever heard that song. I was in my late teens, and we were driving at home, home from the field. It was, we had been driving, uh, harvesting a long day, and we were on the combine, and um, driving home. It was 2 a.m. It was actually Saturday morning, 2 a.m., and uh, we'd been driving, you know, all day and almost half the night, and it was Sunday early morning. We were driving home, and, and, and we were driving down this narrow field road, and it, and the fog started to settle down, and the road became slippery, and the grass came, became slippery. And we slid off the road with the combine. And the road, ditch was really deep. It had been dug up with an excavator, and it, it, it just, it, we almost, you know, capsized with the combine. It was just like we had to shut down the engine because it might, you know, uh, cause oil pressure to drop and so forth. But anyway, so we were sitting there. Mosquitoes were biting. It was 2 a.m. We were sleepy. We were tired. And I turn on the radio, and lo and behold, there was the song, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Now, the song, if you look at the lyrics, it says, In every life we have trouble, but when you worry, you make it double. And it says, Ain't got no place to lay your head. Somebody came and took your bed, but don't worry, be happy. The landlord says your rent is late. He may have to litigate, but don't worry, be happy. But he doesn't give you a reason not to worry, right? There's no reason. Just don't worry, right? But, but how do you do that? How can you just not worry? Well, Paul gives us the solution. Paul says, doesn't say just stop it. He says, replace it. He says, redirect your worry. Cast all your cares upon him, Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 7, for he cares for you. Stop worrying, yes, but then cast your care upon the Lord. How oftentimes do we worry, but the last thing we do is we cast it upon the Lord. We try everything else first. We lay up wake at night. We have a, a really tense stomach for a couple of days, maybe develop some ulcers. <laughs> and, and then after we've tried everything, then maybe we should now go to prayer. Well, Paul would say, no, don't do that. First thing is redirect your worry and start to pray. There was a plaque that read this way. It says, why pray when you can worry? The Bible says the opposite. Why worry when you can pray? So redirect your worry to prayer. You know, it's an act of the will. It's a choice that you have to make. You have to choose to stop worrying and redirect it to prayer. So then the question is, what is prayer? Well, be anxious for nothing, um, but in everything by prayer. Prayer speaks of adoration. It speaks of devotion. It speaks of submission. 
speaks of re really that recognizing that God is in control. When you pray, you know, say you would get on your knees and pray, you're submitting, you're, you're surrendering, and you're giving adoration to God. In Acts chapter 4, the disciples were threatened. They were told to no longer preach the gospel or face consequences. Well, what did they do? Well, they went back to their church, their location where they were meeting, and they began to pray. And notice how they prayed. They said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. That's how they started their prayer. Lord, you are God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. They recognized the lordship, that God is the creator of the universe, and they, they, they recognize who they were talking to. When we do that in our prayer, and we have a little problem, and we recognize that we're talking to the creator of the universe, something happens in our heart. All of a sudden, the problem is a lot smaller, maybe, than we would have thought. It takes a lot of stress off of our shoulders. When you are praying, and as we said here, one of the things about praying is adoration. It's giving worship to God. It's a very hard time to worry when you worship God. It's, it's hard to worry and worship at the same time. Um, I think that, that, that coming before the Lord in prayer is important, and we do that. But we need to understand how we come in prayer, and that we, that we come adoring the Lord. Sometimes we just come mechanically into the throne room and we just kind of have our, our worry list and we can give it to God and pray, but there's, there's a lack of adoration. There's a lack of worship going on. It's a very dry and mechanical relationship there with God. We need to spend a little bit more time and, and worship the Lord. That was one of the things that I had to learn as a Christian when I came to the Lord, is I had to learn to worship God. What it really means to sit before the God, the Lord, just sit before him, be quiet before him, and just worship him. Communicate with God. And so Paul says, do that. Spend time in God's presence and worship him. Redirect your worry to adoration. Cast your care upon him, for he cares for you. And so pray, and then the second word he has is supplication. The word supplication means to plead, it means to entreat, or to humbly and earnestly ask. Earnestly share your needs and your problems to God. So come before him in adoration, worshiping God, first and foremost. Recognizing who he is, the creator of the universe. Give him worth for who he is. And then, after you've done that, then you give him your requests. You share the stress and the worry that you have. Sometimes when we're stressed, we maybe pray less. And sometimes when we're stressed, maybe it causes us <coughs> to pray even more. But we should pray. We should come before the Lord and, and, and give him our burdens. In Luke chapter 11, verse 8, uh, Jesus tells the story of a friend who needed bread. And he went out at midnight, and he went to his friend's house, and he knocked on the door, and he asks for bread. And um, he just kept knocking, and he was persistent, and his friend went up and gave him bread. And then he tells another story of this woman in Luke 18, where she went to this unjust judge, or, or rather this judge who didn't fear God, and she was persistent that, that this judge should help her in her case against a fellow uh, individual. And the judge finally said, okay, you know what? I'm going to do this because of her persistent knocking, because of her persistent request. I'm going to do this. What Jesus is saying is that if an unjust or, or, or ungodly judge would do this, if, if even he would listen to you, when you are fervent in prayer, how much more your heavenly Father who is just and who is kind and who is loving? How much more would he heed your prayers? In John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, this is what John says. He says, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. 
And so worship God and earnestly make your requests to the Lord. And then thirdly, what he says is give thanks. In the midst of our anxiety, we need to stop and give thanks to God. Just thank him for whatever is going on in your life. Thank him for saving you. Thank him for caring for you. Thank him for hearing your prayer. Thank him for taking care of your problems, for taking care of your needs. I think that oftentimes, if we will look at the list of needs in our life or things that we worry about or anxieties, we would put that list, and then we put the list of things that we are really thankful about, they can vary in length. One is much longer than the other. And in our coming uh, week, we will start to talk more about how we are to think. Verse 8, finally, rather than things that are true and noble and, and, and just and all these things, how we are to think. And I think when we do that, our thankful list will become a lot longer. And Paul will tell us how, how to manage our thought process. And so we need to, to come and worship the Lord in prayer, give him worth, and then we, we, we let our needs be known, but then we finish by thanking the Lord, giving thanks that he's hearing our prayer, give him thanks that he's going to take care of these issues, these problems. And oftentimes I think that is something that can be lacking in our life. Remember the ten lepers that were healed? They were all healed. But only one came back and thanked Jesus for healing him. And do you think that ratio has changed today? Are you that one or are you of the other nine? How often do you really thank God for what he has done in your life? There's another thing that we can thank God for. We, th we can thank God for anxieties. You might say, that's the last thing I would thank God for. Well, that's what James says. He says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why would we thank God for trials? Because they cause us to grow and to mature. If we never faced trials, we would not grow in Christ. We need trials. That's just how we humans are. We need trials. We need to be tested. Because when we're tested we get to see where we're weak. We get to see where we need to grow in our lives. So we need tests. And so God will test us occasionally. And so when we face a trial, James says, you know, rejoice, because it will help you to grow even more in Christ. Now notice the word request, be made known to God. It doesn't say let your demands be known to God or let your commands be known to God. You don't come to God and say, God, I command you. Or, God, I demand. No, these are requests. We recognize that God is Lord, and we're not. That he is God, and we're not God. So they're, they're requests. That, that's what they are. But we leave it in God's hands, that he can fulfill them, or maybe not, or, or in, in a way that he sees fit. And so we need to recognize that when we come, that they are requests. Sometimes we see, when we come before the Lord and we recognize, you know, who God is and, and we, we let our needs be known and we're, we feel really weak, you know. We just can't handle this. This is just too much for us. We might see that as a, as, as a, a negative, but really it's a positive. It's a positive when we are weak before the Lord. And we recognize that only God can work, you know. We can't. It's really a positive because Paul says, when I am weak, then he is strong. When we come before the Lord in weakness, I think that's oftentimes when God can, can begin to work, when we step out of the way. Sometimes we want to fix the problem. We, we know how it's supposed to be done. We know how we could resolve the issue. And we are stressed out about it. But it's not until we recognize that I don't have all the answers. I, I, I need the Lord and we're really broken and weak before the Lord, and we step out of the way, and that's when God begins to work. And so Hudson Taylor, he puts it this way. He says, um, let us give up our work or plans or selves or lives or loved ones or influence or all right into God's hand. And then when we have given all over to him, 
there will be nothing left for us to be worried about. That can be hard, right? To give up everything to the Lord. My life is yours, Lord. It's all yours. Just give up completely. But I think when we do that, when we can finally do that, we come before the Lord and we can actually surrender completely and fully all our problems to the Lord in prayer, in supplication, in thanksgiving, we graduate to verse 7, where it says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When, when we receive Christ, we make peace with God, right? You have peace with God. Before you're really an enemy, God is your enemy in a sense, because you're, you know, he wants you to be saved, but but you have to stand before a fearful judge because you have sin. But when you receive Christ and he comes into your heart and he forgives your sin, you have peace with God. You're no longer fearful of God. But he now becomes your loving heavenly father. But when we turn over everything to the Lord, then we begin to experience the peace of God. And this peace is a gift from God. It's something that God gives to us. Can you imagine when you have all your things that you worry about, you, you, you're weak and you're broken and you come and you, you shovel it all over to the Lord, you give it all to him, and then God says, ah, great, now you're finally my child. You give everything to me. I'm going to give you a gift. And he gives you the gift of peace in return of all your problems. John 14 says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So God gives in return. He gives you a gift for all the problems. He gives you the gift of peace. And it's a peace that surpasses, it says, your all understanding. It's a deep inside peace that makes you at rest, even when there is conflict and storms all around. I like that picture of a hurricane. You have a hurricane that blows in. You have the center of the eye. You have the place where it's calm and tranquil, even though all around there's storm. And that is the peace of God. It's, it's that way. It's possible that we can have peace, even though the storms of life are howling all around us. It says here, um, peace, a peace that surpasses understanding. It, it, the world might look at you and say, how is it possible? How can you have peace? How come you're not wringing your hands considering your circumstances around you? Well, the reason is because you have graduated from verse 6 to verse 7. You have, you, have, you have the ability now to give everything over to the Lord. You've surrendered and you've given to God and because of that, you, that is possible. You have now a peace that surpasses all understanding. And it says, and he will guard your mind. This, again, is military language. God's peace will be the security guard at the entrance of your heart. He will guard it. And so we need to give everything to the Lord. Really come in weakness. And then God gives us peace. There was this man who was walking in this gorge. He was walking on this narrow cliff, and it was dark. He couldn't see, and it was completely dark inside the ravine. And as he walked, he, he slid off the ravine, and he bounced and through the rocks, and he went down, and finally was able to hold on to a shrub that was growing in the cliff, and he held on for dear life. And he cried for help, and he prayed, and finally he thought, I can't hold on much longer. I'll just have to let go and just see how far I'm going to drop and maybe get killed down a ravine. And when he couldn't hold any longer, he, he just let go. And he fell six inches to the bottom of the ravine. And sometimes, I think that can be in our life, we, we hold on to this problem. Some reason we just don't let go. And when we do, we might find out that God is right there. He's going to take care of these problems. And so Jesus, his own words, he says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, because the world, what does the world give? It only gives problems and worries and struggles and storms and, and just 
there's all that there. But Jesus says, I don't give that way. I, he says, I give peace to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So let go of your worries and let God be in charge of your life. Make praying a habit. Make casting your care upon the Lord a habit. When there are things that you're worried about, don't wait till you come home at night or in the morning and pray about it. Make it a habit to continually pray to the Lord and give these things over to the Lord. Worship Him and thank Him. And you will find that the worries of your life dissipate and you replace with peace. And, and so... Graduating from verse 6 to verse 7, again, as we saw in the beginning of our uh, message, that if we look at where peace is found, it's chapter 4. But if you do chapter 1, 2, and 3, then chapter 4 is possible. If you have the single eye that God is your creator and you worship him only. Number two, if you're humble and you come in brokenness. And number three, if you have a spiritual mind and you thank God for, uh, you know, for your life, and you, 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 if, if that is possible, then you come to chapter 4 where peace is possible. So we see that peace didn't come first, it came last. And so we need to apply chapter 1, 2, and 3. If we have these things in our life, then we will begin to experience chapter 4, and we will truly experience peace in our life. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you, Lord, that as believers that we have an option that we can redirect or worry, and we can redirect it to you. And we thank you, Lord, that <clears throat> it's, it's, it's not that you grudgingly receive our problems, or, um, but it's you desire for us to give you our problems. You desire for us to, to just give up and just say, Lord, I, I, I surrender, I give these issues to you, Worrying about them will make, won't make anything better. It doesn't mean that we're not responsible. Just like a bird, it does go out and it seeks its food, but it doesn't worry about these things. It gives them over to the Lord. So should we. And so we pray, Lord, all of us in this room this morning. Maybe there are those here this morning that feel that, you know, we, I worried a lot. And it's just maybe caused health issues. I pray this morning, just as we sit before you, that this is the time to come and to just give your worries over to the Lord. And uh, when you step out the door, it will come back, but redo it. Just give them over to the Lord, over and over. Surrender, and you will find God's peace in your heart. And I just pray for everyone here this morning, Lord. Um, would you help them uh, to trust you and to believe you, and to respond to chapter 4. To not be anxious, but to give these things over to the Lord and experience peace. In Jesus' name, amen.